I'm very happy to present Lori Petro, child advocate and founder of Teach Through Love. Welcome, Lori. Hi, Devin. Thanks for having me back. Yes, I'm so happy that you're here. Thank you for coming back for the second edition of this conference. We're so happy to have you here. Yes, I know we're going to have fun. Yes, absolutely. And I'd love for um, everyone in the audience who maybe um, hasn't met you before and doesn't know you, could you just tell us a bit about yourself and what you do? Uh, so like you mentioned, Teach Through Love is an organization, a website that I founded way back in 2000 something. It's like the last decade has just flown by. It's crazy. Um, but I started Teach Through Love as I always envisioned it with, with three sort of dedicated arms, advocacy, education, and community building. Um, but my goal was really, and the goal has become more clear as I have evolved, um, had my own child um, after I started uh, Teach Through Love and, and shifted many times. But I, now I'm really um, focused on just shifting into helping um, parents and children have better relationships, uh, better communication. Um, so just bringing respect um, and relationship back into parenting. And so I, I started Teach Through Love. It's now a website. So we, ha we have the education. There's lots of, um, I go online daily on social media and share all kinds of education, the advocacy through media, through my YouTube channel, things like that. Um, and community building just through, I mean, Facebook has allowed so many of us to connect and to build that community. So for me, it's just about changing the parenting paradigm to one that's more um, relationship oriented. Yeah. I love that because parenting above all else, it's the nurturing of a relationship. I mean, the essence of parenting is it's a relationship. And so building up that relationship um, through communication is um, such a powerful skill to learn. Yes. And one that many of us were not, we didn't really have those models growing up. Some of us did. Um, but I think the majority of us experienced maybe parenting that was um, maybe more focused on, you know, just keeping in line and, and sort of obedience and respecting authority as opposed to like, let's cultivate respect for all and empathy and um, not just obedience, but real learning, real true um, skill building, which is missing from a lot of the uh, traditional kinds of discipline that we think of when we think about parenting and, and kids. It's so true. And I oftentimes say to parents that um, respect is a two way street and that when we're looking at when we're equating obedience with respect, then we are forgetting that um, respect really is this two way street and it's inherent both directions in the relationship. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we can't model um, for our children this demand you know, of respect and then expect them to not go out and then demand it in ways or take a power um, position when they're, when they're feeling disrespected. So it's definitely our kids learn from our model. So it's a two way street, but mo because they're learning, you know, not even just because we want to try to earn that respect or think or teach that respect, but really it's, it goes to that, the crux of the relationship too, and that trust that's built. So yeah, yes, definitely yes. two way. Yes. I love it that it's like, um, so much of it, so much of so many things in parenting come back to this idea of trust and, uh, the more trust that we have in ourselves and in our children, that's where we can kind of, uh, loosen our um, grip on the what I like to call the illusion of control because it really is uh, an illusion and yes. um, really get into the flow with respect and communication. Yeah, I love that. It is an illusion of control. We, we might think that we have we have it and we can live in that, in that bubble of fantasy for a while, but yes, it's so true. And it's really we um, have to cut. I think one reason why toddlerhood is so frustrating is because we're really starting to come to grips with because we're confronted with um, control being an illusion. We're coming to grips with the idea that, oh my gosh, I thought I was in control, but really 
this is just an illusion. I can't control another human being. And it's really in toddlerhood where we um, learn this um, very well. <laughs> yes, for sure. You know, we get right out of the gate. We need to get our, you know, our parenting shoes on. So we get some of those really tough challenges early, I think. But I mean, we have to look at those little toddler brains. And I think once parents really understand that you can't force a brain that's so immature to do things that are, you know, expecting them to be thoughtful and um, compliant and, and, you know, regulate themselves easily. That's just, it's not even about, you know, us trying to find that control at that point. It's like, can we help, let's help parents understand behavior from, from neuro, from, you know, like this neuroscientific point of view where we look at the brain and the development, because I think once we give parents just that little piece they can trust themselves because finally they think, okay, I'm not, it's not that I'm doing something wrong. It's that I can't make a, a, a tricycle, you know, act like a motorcycle. You know, this little brain has to do what the little brain does in, and learn in increments and, and build um, before we can see that maturity that we, that we sometimes expect from toddlers. You find in your work that parents expect sort of this, you know, like once I tell you no or this or that, then, that's it. There should be no tears or discussion or any of this. It's sort of like, I don't understand why they're not listening. Mm -hmm. It's so true. And that's why, you know, it, for me, when I look at toddlers and toddler development, what I teach parents is that it's a twofold process where we're looking at, at toddlers and we're saying, okay, so we're learn they're learning right now the expectation. So it's something that, first of all, we don't learn as adults even information on the first time. So first they have to learn this expectation. They need to learn this information, which takes several tries and it, it happens with time. But then also, once they learn it, it doesn't always mean they can execute it or go to it because they're impulsive by nature due to their brain development. And so really it's this uh, two-fold um, process or there's, there's two aspects of, that's affecting yeah. a, a child, toddler's ability to quote unquote, you know, listen and follow through. Right. Well, I love that. The execution. It's like, yes, they, they may have heard it and learned the lesson and repeated it back to you, but the execution part is not going to always go so smoothly because they're still limited by yeah, their skills and their, their brain power. Mm -hmm. It's so true. Well, and today we're here to talk about highly sensitive children and what that looks like in toddlerhood. And I'm curious, can you just start by explaining what it means for to be highly sensitive? So highly sensitive people, which we have estimates now are as high as 20% of the population. So there's, there's a lot of highly sensitive um, little ones and adults running out there. And essentially, it's a person who is sensitive to their environment. Just, um, we have, um, gosh, my words escape me. Sometimes when we get overwhelmed, our brain shuts down, and so do the words. <laughs> so I'm speaking from personal experience. But just, you know, we can see a highly sensitive child and say that, oh, they they cover their ears when there's loud noises or they get overwhelmed and confused or anxious much more quickly than say, you know, a, a typical child might, or we might say, um, or might see kids that worry a lot. So there's different parts of sensitive. We can have physical sensitivity where we're um, like tactile sensitive. So clothes, tags, um, when, when kids say that clothes are itchy or too tight or they don't like the seams or the tags, they can have sensory sensitivities. Or if they don't like having their hair brushed or brushing their teeth, those kinds of struggles that we see that we sometimes think are just, you know, power control issues with a toddler or a young child um, often are related to their, their body taking in so much information that they can't process it fast enough for them to then adapt and just go with the flow. So they need a, a lot of rest to recoup from overwhelm, from sensory overwhelm. Um, they need a lot of relationship and attachment because they tend to worry and be anxious. And so that attachment really helps ground sensitive kids. Um, and they need a lot of relaxation tools because when you have a system that can become quickly uh, hyper aroused, um, over aroused, then we have to learn to find ways to not get rid of this sensitivity because I, as an adult, I have much more control over my sensitivities, but they didn't go away. 
Um, I still jump when I hear loud noises. Um, and, and to the point where I can physically feel pain. If I'm not expecting it and someone walks into a room and coughs and I'm not expecting it or I'm really focused, it, it actually, I feel skin sensitivity and pain when, when something like that happens. So, you know, we can think, oh, they're being too sensitive, they're being overdramatic, they're being reactive, but this is, there are real physiological effects um, that happen with hypersensitivity or highly sensitive highly sensitive people. But in a nutshell, it can be physical, it can be mental, so the worrying, the overthinking, um, and it can be emotional. Kids can be, you know, a kid that has such empathy that they may shut down. You know, sometimes highly sensitive kids can seem so unempathetic because they're overwhelmed by how much they feel, and so they shut down. Um, but emotionally, mentally, or physically, you can um, have any of that combination uh, sensitivities and, and be in that group that we call highly sensitive. That's really helpful to um, explain the, the different um, aspects or groups of, you know, where physical, emotional, mental, to understand that there are all different types of sensitivity. And you brought up a really great point that is whenever we um, see a child in this state of overwhelm, Sometimes we can um, jump to a conclusion of, oh my goodness, they're just, they're being difficult right now. They're so out of control, you know, all of these judgments on, but really what's happening is an extreme sense of overwhelm and that they are in need of our guidance to come back to their equilibrium. Exactly. Exactly. And, and sometimes, you know, we say, oh, we're, you know, who's going to help them out in the world? You know, that's always the fear. It's like, if I give them too much, then what are they going to do when they're out in the world? But when we give them so much at home in the safe place or as teachers, when we provide um, that place for them to learn without judgment, without shame to, and to recover. So they learn through these, these big overwhelming emotions um, that happen. We learn, okay, this is what's happening to my system. I, you know, I, I just want to run and hide. So we know that, okay, so what's going to help that child? Well, maybe a quiet space. So in, in kindergartens or in preschools, they usually have things like tents or, you know, places where kids can go and get um, some privacy or whether it's sitting underneath, um, you know, a, a play, a play section, you know, outside a play structure outside or something, a place where they can go and sort of feel safe, quiet, dark and reset their system. Um, so helping just understanding what kind of sensitivity uh, your child or your students may have is going to help them. It's not going to help get rid of it, but it's going to help them understand what happens to their body and then how we can, you know, move through that. Mm -hmm. Yes. And you mentioned that there is a real um, physiological response. And is that um, the stress response that we, we have within us? Is that's what, is that what is being activated in these moments of, um, overwhelm um, in a highly sensitive child? Definitely the stress response can, is triggered. Um, but also there's, and this would be something that, you know, an OT would have better language around, but it's also sometimes a lack of sensory information. So my child, for example, um, she needs a lot of deep pressure. So when she's feeling anxious or when she's worried, or just if she just has a lot of, um, you know, anxious energy in her body that, that doesn't seem to be, um, she's not able to discharge and channel properly. She needs deep pressure um, because she doesn't actually feel, she's also a kid that when she was little, she'd run in and she'd squeeze you so hard that you thought you were going to like lose your breath or she'd run in and knock things over and have no idea that she was knocking things over or things would be all over her face when she was eating. And she was completely unaware because her, she was under responsive to her sensory environment. Um, and then she also had uh, reactivity to things like loud sounds. So that's when, um, you know, definitely her, her stress response system would be triggered, but also um, a big chaotic environment could trigger that response in her. So it just, it depends on the child and what their specific sensitivities are, you know, how they get triggered. Um, but some kids actually need more input. You know, it's not that there's too much input, it's actually that they're not getting enough. And so their systems are out of balance for that very reason. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's um, a great distinction to draw that it's 
not um, necessarily all um, overwhelm sometimes is not having enough information and really the the goal is to find the equilibri equilibrium that it can be you know too much or too little and that you're kind of aiming for this equilibrium exactly exactly and, and you might if you have for example um, a young child that is just running and running around the house and you're trying to you know ha have baby or, or cook dinner or whatever you're doing and, and no matter what you do they just won't stop like send them out into a sand, like some sand structure, some digging or, you know, lifting heavy, um, some heavy work or swinging is a really great way to help um, reset and um, help a kid calm down. Send them outside to the swings. But that physical activity is often really important when we have kids who seem um, just wound up and like, the, and we can't bring them down and we think, oh, they're not listening. Oh, they just don't want to stop. But no, it's that they don't know what to, if they stop, they might, they might feel like they, they're going to explode and they don't know what to do with the, with the energy, um, and the sensations that are coursing through their body. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so true. And I love those, uh, little tips. That's, um, really helpful. And I'm curious. So, Whenever we, so if we're with a, a highly sensitive child, sometimes we can find ourselves um, feeling sensitive and triggered. And when, um, when we're feeling triggered, we may not respond um, the way that we envision. And so sometimes we um, un unknowingly kind of um, cause some stress on the attachment with our child and i'm just curious why is it important to protect uh, this parent-child relationship and this attachment um, even more so for a highly sensitive child well when we think about uh, what a highly sensitive child needs uh, or what's maybe missing and the thing that I come back to is they, they rely on that at attachment for their sense of safety, right? To find the sense of stability. When you go into a world that seems overwhelming and you're young and you're learning to process all of these big intrusive, um, you know, sensory feelings, whether it's, you know, too much information coming into your mind or too much, you know, sensory information bombarding, you know, your actual, your eyes, your ears, what do we need to uh, build resilience? We need, a, we need a caregiver, we need an attachment figure. We need someone that's a home base so that when we start, and especially toddlers, they're gonna go out and they don't know that they're sensitive, right? A toddler doesn't go out thinking, well, I'm sensitive, so I'm going to be careful and not you know, go into loud noises or, or walk into somebody who's going to you know, jump up or where, you know, where there's too much activity. You, do, you will see them, they're cautious. They know that they're not necessarily going to necessarily run into a situation but at the same time they need to be able to explore freely and then when they get overwhelmed come back and have someone as a base say I'm here for you that was overwhelming that you didn't expect that to happen like not give them feelings not saying oh you know I don't always want to I think it's good to give kids uh, the literacy and the language around feelings but I do also in you know just parenting my own highly sensitive child I am cautious and careful not to just name her feelings for her all the time, um, but maybe describe what happened to her. You know, when you walked in and that ball came at you, you weren't expecting that. You know, instead of saying, oh, you got scared. Because I don't want to necessarily just, you know, name her. I do want to name feelings, for, especially for little children, to give them language. But I, you know, I also want to help children describe what happens and then help them identify in their body where that was um, where that felt, what, what did they feel? Um, cause sometimes maybe it's not a physical sensation, but it's, um, you know, something cognitively or mentally that happens to them that, that we need to be aware of and, and help them, you know, like maybe they're shutting down and wanting to, you know, check out. And we have that attachment helps keep kids connected and aware and that's what builds resilience so it's important and here's the thing we're gonna mess up we're gonna maybe re react and be triggered especially by toddlers um so repair is it's not just that we oh we have to keep this relationship intact because i can just like think back to my own toddler years and be like well i don't know if i was always so 
you know, re responding appropriately. I mean, I did for the most part, but we all have moments where we're not going to be able to keep it together, especially if we're building our tolerance and working on our own flexibility. Um, so repair comes in handy. And repair is just, you know, going back and acknowledging that when I yelled, I could tell by, you know, the look on your face that when I yelled and made that loud noise that, I mean, this is where I might say that was probably scary for you, or I'm wondering if that was scary for you. That's when I might go back and, and help a child just see that we all react sometimes and then build the lesson um, through the repair and not just, I just don't want anybody to think that, you know, perfection is the goal here. Absolutely. Um, there's so much uh, power in this uh, vulnerability, having this vulnerability um, and because it takes a certain amount of vulnerability to kind of cross the bridge and create the repair. Um, if we do lose our, our temper and I, I like to say to parents that each and every moment is an invitation to begin again that, um, you know, it's just because um, you know, maybe we lost our temper or something just didn't go the way that we thought. It doesn't mean that all is lost. It's, you know, things are ruined. It just means that, okay, in this moment, I can try again. I can begin again. And, um, yeah, and I just love this idea of embracing a certain amount of vulnerability to kind of cross that bridge to get to the point to make the, the repair in the relationship. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I'm curious, um, how do you feel or how do you um, recommend um, parents to learn to cope with their frustration, especially if they're um, with parenting a child that is inflexible or um, reactive to small changes, what are some ways that they can learn to, to cope with the frustration that they feel in these moments? So this is where I think there's a couple of ways we can do that. One, by really understanding what we spoke about earlier, which was the brain development piece. Um, it's really hard to be compassionate with a child that you think is just doing things because they want to or just doing it to get under your skin um, or needs to learn a lesson. When we have that perspective because we think that they should know because we told them or whatever our reasons, you know, I was raised this way. This is what my parents did that when we have that perspective and we sort of take that hard line, it's hard to be open to anything else. It's hard to be open to a child who is so insistent on having, um, you know, less milk in the Rice Krispies because it's too wet on their, on their mouth. You know, that's just too wet. I need it dry. And this is, you know, a kid with sensory challenges may refuse the apple because it's too wet and only eat, you know, pasta for the first, you know, six months of age three or whatever. You know, there's so many ways that it can express itself. And we may think, you know, I just made this beautiful meal and all you want to eat is this dry cereal or this plain pasta kind of thing. And so taking a step back and always remembering, okay, what's this brain capable of right now? Is this brain capable of being um, flexible and open? And when you see a little toddler face all scrunched up and their arms crossed or they won't look at you or they're down on the floor or they're wailing, we can say, okay, there, this is a brain that's not ready to learn. It's not ready to be responsive. So at that point, I take care of myself. This is where I want parents to go. It's like, if, as long as that kid is safe and not hurting anybody or going to hurt themselves, go and take care of yourself in that moment. If you feel like you can't cope and you want to scream or you want to punish or you want to threaten, just walk away. Walk away, start breathing, you know, look at the happy little pictures of little baby feet that are up on the wall, you know, grab a glass of water and, and drink that because that takes time and it gives you a moment for your system to just bring itself down. Um, but really walk away and, and practice self-care in those moments because you, us being able to be adaptive and flexible, that doesn't mean that we allow, you know, the child to throw the breakfast across of the room 
right? Or it doesn't mean that if the child is screaming and the baby's in the other room, well, it doesn't mean that we just let them scream. It means maybe we have to pick them up and take them outside. But if you can't scream inside, you're having some big feelings. I want to help you get them out. Your brother's sleeping, you know, and a few words. I like to, you know, when we're having trouble coping, don't talk. I like to tell parents. So just look at the brain. Can it handle it? Walk away. Take care of yourself are two of my biggest um, ways for parents to just sort of cope in those moments because you can't do anything else. If you're feeling so stressed out, don't rely on your thinking brain to be thoughtful or compassionate or, you know, capable of (laughs) speech that isn't threatening or forceful. Just really just take that time for yourself and walk away. Yes. It's such, um, it's such a good reminder because I think sometimes we feel like that, you know, we should know how to handle this situation. We should have it all figured out. and We should do something, you know, like, oh my gosh, we have to do something right now in this moment. And it's such a great reminder that we can just take a moment for ourselves. We can walk away and, um, that's okay. That it's, you know, the world's not going to end if, We don't address something that's happening right now in this moment. Addressing ourselves and how we feel first can um, offer so much guidance and um, wisdom for what comes next. Yeah, and we'll start to, once we bring ourselves down, then our thinking brain comes back online and we can come up with something. It's Then in that moment, we're like, what do I do? We're not, what do I do? What do I do? We go, okay, this is where I can go next. This is where I know. I have um, the ability to make some change. Like, what can I change? What do I have power over in this moment? And also, I want to just mention, when I say walk away, I I certainly don't mean that in the punitive way where we tell a young child, you know, I'm not going to talk to you until you can calm down or, you know, I'm going to leave you here because I can't handle this. We never want to let our kids um, think that we can't handle something because that, that would just further dysregulate them, especially a sensitive child who really depends on somebody in the room being regulated if we show them through our tone or through our energy or through our words um that we that they're too much for us that's going to probably escalate the tension in the situation for us so it's as much as you can take that time walk away um, but do it with uh, without um making your child feel like they're like you're abandoning them you know, let them know where you're going and what you're going to do. Mommy's going to go take three deep. I'm going to go in the other room, take three deep breaths. I'm going to go get a glass of water. And then if they're like just screaming and crying, which sometimes highly sensitive toddlers will do. I mean, my, and from the smallest change, this can happen. I remember walking out of a birthday party with my then three and a half, four year old. And the change was we were now going to the left after the birthday party up to have dinner at the farmer's market. And we were not going left. We we're not going right to the car to get her sweater because we had already gotten her sweater from the car. Well, this was the plan that she had in her head was we're leaving the party. We're going to the car to get my sweater and then we're going out to eat. Well, we changed that. And as silly as it sounds and as simple as it sounds like here, honey, here, we already got your sweater. Her brain could not handle that change in that moment. And she threw herself on the floor, on the sidewalk in public. Um, And really, you know, I had thoughts of, well, maybe I should pick her up and, you know, help her. But it was like, no, she just needed to discharge these awful feelings that were, uh, that overcame her in that moment and just letting her have that moment um, was what I needed to do. But I had to get really comfortable with being okay when she wasn't necessarily okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think one of um, our greatest, some of our greatest work in life is really becoming okay with the full spectrum of human emotion, the emotions that we label comfortable, that we label uncomfortable. I mean, you know, all these emotions are there and they're, they're emotions and they're not really good or bad but we put labels on them. And I, I think in part to help us understand and give context to the emotions. But um, yes, whenever we really start to learn how to embrace all of the emotions, because our toddlers, they embrace them all. They still, they are at a point, they live in the moment, they feel all the emotions, they express all the emotions. And we did too at one point. But then 
we um, have lost that ability through, I don't know how we were parented or school or society, so many different reasons, you know, and it's all really, the messages. Yes. Yeah. School, home, society, like all those messages that we received about what's, especially boys, they, I feel like they get the brunt of it because boys are supposed to have certain emotions or not supposed to show certain emotions. At least that was thinking, at least for many, many decades, um, you know, this tough kind of thing, this manhood and these ideas about masculinity um, that have really not served our kids um, and really, yeah, put them out of touch with their emotions when emotions are so very important to, and all of the emotions, like you said, the whole spectrum is so very important to just living a, an emotionally healthy life, I think, and being able to take it all in and process it without it overtaking us and overwhelming us. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's so true. And, and a few moments ago, you also brought up something um, so important when you were telling this example um, with your daughter in the sweater is that, um, you know, that it, you said, you know, it seemed kind of silly and it, and it shows like how easily we can, um, you know, something to us that as an adult might seem silly to us is really important to a child and that's what you um were illustrating is that you know in our adult brain this didn't seem like a big deal but to your daughter it was a very big deal and that um just having that understanding right there that um you know toddlers interpret things uh, much differently than we do as adults and just because it's not a big deal for us doesn't mean it's not allowed to be a big deal for someone else yeah exactly exactly really learning to see that children like you said they, they see things differently they really don't have the same adult lens with all this experience i mean how could they right they but we forget that we're looking through this lens of experience whereas they're looking through this lens of hey i've been on the earth for a few thousand days yes it's so true that it's just so innate to us that we forget we have all this experience and yeah. it's such a good point so i just wanted to um re uh illustrate that and i'm curious so you created these um conscious communication cards which are really amazing i have them over on my bookshelf um and i'm curious is there a way um that these cards can bring um some wisdom or can help us out when uh, working with a highly sensitive toddler. Definitely, um, especially because highly sensitive children are typically, uh, can be very sensitive to tone and body language, and they will hear your <laughs> frustration. Even if you're not expressing in words frustration, they will feel that frustration if it's if it's there if you haven't dealt with it if you're if you're saying happy things and delivering it with like through gritted teeth they're going to pick up on that stuff or not even through gritted teeth you know but if it's just stuck in there if you're feeling uneasy and unsettled and or angry they're going to pick up on that more than their words and then when your words don't match your energy they're going to get more dysregulated um, so what the cards help us do is it, it, it's not just about language. They're not just about, oh, here's some scripts that you can use. It's about, because also on the cards are these perspective shifts. So sometimes the words maybe aren't going to match or you're not going to say that entire sentence to a toddler. But what you can do is shift. So instead of uh, maybe going in and wanting to um, give them the alternative or tell them what they should be doing, you can go in and um, use the cards and it might say, um, just go in and notice without judgment. I see that you want to play with the toy that your brother is using. You know, instead of give him back that toy or who was playing with it first, we go in and we want to fix everything or we want to try to get everybody to share or do all these things. Just go in and notice a name. So the cards give us directions like that. They give us the perspective shift um, that will help us focus on what we should be focusing on help us direct us and guide us to looking at be beyond behavior and looking to intention or honoring the good intention or prompting with a question when that might be appropriate instead of just giving a directive um so f for any age but toddlers especially because you don't always want to talk 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 with kids some kids i mean i had a really verbal um daughter she spoke my daughter was super verbal spoke really early but she still didn't she still processed language 
like a two-year-old, right? So I could, you know, going into long lectures, she's going to shut me off after a little bit. So just keeping our language, um, becoming aware of our language, but our nonverbal language and our tone and our intention as much as what we actually say is what's so important, I think, especially at that toddler years. And that's what the cards offer that. They can really help with that. Okay, well, I don't know what to say, but here's how you can think. Like maybe you still don't know what to say. And maybe this word isn't totally appropriate or you know your child doesn't, um, isn't ready for talking yet. But can I lower myself just to get down at my child's level? So it's just the little things like that that are really important. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's so true. It makes um, our body language has such a, um, it communicates a lot. It has a, a large influence on yes. what's happening with our child. Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Is there anything else you'd like to add today about uh, parenting highly sensitive toddlers? I think just if we can, I think that highly, you know, kids if, or parents, if they're told that they have a high, or they see that they have a highly sensitive child or someone um, recognizes this in their child, sometimes it can be seen as a detriment. Um, especially when you run up against the school environment, which can be really hard on sensitive kids, not only because of the physical sensory overwhelm, like fluorescent lights and all kinds of stuff on the, on the walls everywhere and all the noise, um, but also the rigid routines, you know, having to raise your hand to go to the bathroom or stand in lines or only, you know, you only get to run in certain spaces. And sometimes highly sensitive kids can't cope with all of that. Now, some, sometimes they can, and then they get home and they melt down. But sometimes they can become, you know, behavior problems. And then they start, you know, teachers that use the stoplight system. You might have a highly sensitive child that's always on the red because they can't control their bodies because they're so overwhelmed. So we see it. We can, it can be easy to see highly sensitive children as having all these um, challenges. But I think it's really important to remember all of the amazing qualities that come with being highly sensitive, um, being intuitive, being creative, being really introspective, um, being really uh, cautious and curious and interested about, you know, in the world, even though it's so overwhelming um, and, and sensitive because they're so aware of other people's feelings. I mean, these are really good traits. And if we can remember that when we nurture, and actually there's, there's science now to back this up, studies um, that have shown that, yes, a sensitive child might wither and you know, really do poorly under harsh uh, circumstances. But when they are given the kind of love and attention and care that they need, they thrive beyond anything that we could imagine. Um, and they really do have amazing capacity to understand the emotions of others and to just be really perceptive and so when I, I think it's important to um, just recognize the value that these kids have as hard as it may be um, to parent a, a highly sensitive child and as confusing as it may be when you if you're not also highly sensitive um, I know my mom for example was she was very emotionally sensitive but she didn't have any of the tactile sensitivities that I have so when I was and this was in the 70s and I was refusing to put on the itchy pants she didn't know what was she didn't have that experience one to understand why why I thought they were too scratchy and why I wouldn't put them on um, but now we have understanding we can seek out you know that knowledge so I think it's important to um, just recognize that it's a real thing as well it's not just oh they're being dramatic it's actually um real for them that they're really experiencing uh challenges which will grow into be some of their greatest gifts yes thank you so much for bringing up um the strengths and gifts of um highly sensitive children that you know there's as each unique individual each and every one of us um we're unique and we all have strengths and weaknesses and when we spend time really focusing on those strengths i think that's when we see a big shift whether we're focusing on our own strengths um or focusing on our child's strengths but focusing on strengths um definitely creates a powerful shift yeah and a powerful partnership with our kids too when we can forge that kind of like we go back to what we said before that trust in the relationship 
um, by building on those strengths. It's, it's a really amazing experience for us. I feel like it brings us back to um, that happy part of parenting where we are creating this relationship and where we're enjoying what we're doing as opposed to feeling so frustrated by the constant need for guidance and redirection and it can, you know, that it can seem to be sometimes. Yeah, I agree. It definitely, it brings us back to that root, um, to that joy, that um, innate joy of um, whenever you first became a parent, that excitement. Yeah. Um, yes. Yes. Well, our time is coming to a close and I know that you have a gift that you'd like to offer our audience. Could you tell us more about that? Yes. So you guys can go and sign up for my um, supporting. If you want more info on sensitive kids and, and some starter tips on how we can really help them and understanding it, maybe you have a sensitive child and you're like, oh, I think my child might be sensitive, but I'm not really sure and what it all means. I have um, an introductory course called Supporting Sensitive Children. So I know that you're going to have the link for that, but it's just a short um, three video and actually our transcripts are almost done. So we have transcripts too for anybody that does not like to um, sit and read or listen or excuse me sit and watch and, and listen to a class. We have the transcripts for um, you guys so that you can just read them uh, read the classes but short three 20 minute sessions um, and I think there's a Q&A in there too all about uh, sensitivity and, and just exploring more in depth about what we were talking about today about how the, there's different types of emotional sensitivity or of sensitivity, mental, physical, emotional, um, and some of the science that uh, has been, um, has recently come out about sensitive children, which um, is really fascinating and, and very supportive, I think, to parents, especially when they're choosing a more conscious or compassionate way of parenting. Helps give a little bit of um, that faith and, okay, I'm, I'm taking the right steps here. Science is backing me up. Mm -hmm. Yes, that definitely um, can be very um, helpful and empowering to have that guidance and to um, know that, okay, this is a, the path that I'm choosing to go on and this path seems to be leading to where I want to go. So thank you so much. That's such a generous gift to offer our audience. And also, where can they go to find out more about you and your work? At teachthroughlove.com or on Facebook. Um, just Google that and you'll find me. I've got, and on YouTube, like I said, I've got um, lots of short Q&A um, videos. So if you have a specific kind of question about your sensitive child or any child, really, um, I have over 100 videos on uh, YouTube that are just short Q&A um, videos, just parenting questions, that sort of thing. And lots of free classes, but teachthroughlove.com or just on the web, social media. Okay, great. Well, thank you. And do you just have um, one last piece of advice or words of encouragement for our audience today? Uh, well, I always, my tagline is just remember that it's about being conscious, not perfect. Um, I think that we put a lot of pressure on ourselves and we go out and we feel judged <laughs> by the, the eyes of other parents or the eyes of our own parents and families and peers and just you know we're all doing the best that we can so just if we can just be conscious and uh not perfect not strive for perfection because it's just a silly ideal yes it's so true that's another illusion perfection control and perfection yes, control and perfection just, woo, just throw throw myself out the window throw those out the window because they definitely do not serve us in the long run Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for being here today, Lori, and sharing all of your passion and wisdom with us. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Devin. I always uh, love chatting with you. It's always fun. Thank you so much. And before we go, I invite everyone to join us in the Raising Toddlers Courageously Facebook group to join the discussion, to uh, give us your feedback, your questions, your thoughts, your opinion matters, and I can't wait to connect with you. Thanks.